there has been a fundamental severing of people's loyalty and commitment to their jobs, to their employers, and to their regions. Globally, this is true. Usually when we go through a downturn, people hold tight to their roles, to their jobs, to their companies, because they're afraid of losing their jobs. But what has happened in this downturn and now this upturn is that people are really, really rethinking what they do, why they do it, with whom they work, with which company they work, what kind of um, elements are part of the employee value equation. People are thinking about that so deeply and they have this fresh air effect, this grass is greener effect. And so the Great Recession followed by a talent revolution, where as leaders, as organizations, we need to be especially attuned to articulating an employee value equation, delivering an employee value equation that is compelling for people. Because the content of our work and how we align with our passions and our work is fundamental to our fulfillment. And that is a criteria for our decision making in regard to who we're going to work for and who we're going to work with. Hello and welcome to Anatomy of a Leader show with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm the founder and CEO of HVO Search. Founders, CEOs and lone HR directors hire me when they feel stuck and under pressure to hire the right senior leaders who will grow their companies. They work with me to ensure they don't hire the wrong person. I'm on a mission to discover what makes a great leader, the skills they have, what drives them, to really dissect what success looks like and what it takes to get to the very top. My aim is to bring to you leadership stories of entrepreneurs, founders, CEOs, investors, authors, leaders from all walks of life, the failures they faced, what they wish they knew before they started, and the hurdles they had to overcome. If you want to be inspired, surprised, and feel like you're not alone in your struggles towards the very top, you're in the right place here on Anatomy of a Leader. Like and comment below and subscribe to make sure you don't miss a single episode. It will change the way you think and may even change your life. Tracy, thank you so much for coming on to the Anatomy of a Leader show. Uh, such a pleasure to meet you. I wish I could do this in person, but I feel like technology is enabling us to be able to have these amazing conversations. And, you know, I saw you work on LinkedIn and then I got your book, The Secrets to, I think it's The Secrets to Happiness at Work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a headhunter, I'm talking about this all the time and, you know, discussing with people about, you know, what grates on them or, you know, what, what does the ideal role look like for them? And so for me, this is like such a fascinating mm -hmm. space to, to discuss. And, um, so thank you for that book. And I did very quickly read it and, um, really some interesting tips from that. Well, I'll, I'll get straight into it. Um, apart from the obvious, why do we work? <laughs> oh, wow. That's a great question. And thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. You know, I think this question of why we work is so important right now. And I think it's a cool moment because we're thinking about it so much more consciously than maybe we did a couple of years ago, you know, because we've been so disrupted. And a really important reason that we work is so that we feel like we have a place to express our talents, express our contribution to a community, um, to feel like we matter within a broader kind of whole of a group and a purpose. And I think sometimes we have a myth in our, you know, Western culture and our Western society that somehow work is drudgery and work is bad. And, you know, it's really best if we can get us get away from work as much as possible. And those things are true, definitely. We need time to rejuvenate and relax and be away. But work itself is a source of fulfillment. It's a source of happiness. It's a source of our opportunity to express our current talents and to develop them as well. Mm. I have so thought, so many thoughts around that because, you know, as a person who takes my work really personally and being a, an entrepreneur and having my own business, you know, your identity can really be very strongly associated with that. And that comes, you know, good things and bad things, especially when it's not going so well in what you're doing. But before we kind of go down that route, I mean, I'm also thinking, well, not everyone has the privilege of, of choosing what they do for a living. I mean, 
and talking about happiness at work, is it, does that come with privilege? Mm-hmm. You know, do, you know, or maybe an alternative was like, what's the, you know, what's the minimum we should be expecting from, from work? Mm-hmm. That's a really important question. I think it's really important that we see that all work has dignity. Like I am so deeply committed to the idea that all work has dignity. And as a community, we need so many different kinds of work to make everything tick. And all of us have a role to fulfill in that. And so I think we need to dream small and, you know, like we might want to dream big and think about all the wonderful things we will do. And we can take the pressure off of ourselves and dream small and know that um, everything that we do in terms of those work contributions matters and is important. And so we can have happiness no matter what kind of work we're doing and we can make a difference no matter what kind of work we're doing. I had the most wonderful experience yesterday. I was at a um, store and I was checking out. I was standing in the checkout lane ready to pay for my items. And, um, you know, I, I wasn't paying a lot of attention to the person in front of me and she left. And then the cashier was taking quite a while to like pull out her change purse and pull out a couple of um, a couple of uh, um, a couple of coins, and I said, you know, what are what are you you know what are you doing? And um, I said, are you making up for the woman in front of me? And sure enough, the woman in front of me had been flustered and confused about currency and about what she owed and everything. And the cashier said, you're good, go ahead. And then she pulled out a few coins and made up for that woman. And it cost her very little in terms of currency, Mm. but she made such a contribution in terms of dignity, in terms of really contributing to this woman's day in a really positive and quiet way. And I just think that's a great example of how all that we do matters and how we show up and the kind of work that we do can matter in so many different ways. So it's kind Mm. of a cool example. Mm. Actually, I had a conversation with Simon Whitehouse a little while ago, and he's the CEO of EcoAge. And he was saying like, well, I was 25. I used to think that sales was the most important function within a business. And I was like, oh, well, you're not, you know, you're not far away from the truth. And he's like, you couldn't be any further from the truth. Mm -hmm. It's like every single one matters. Every single one. It's like, you're the, you know, you're as strong as your weakest link and everybody has to pull together. And, you know, this is exactly what you're saying. And, and I love the, you know, what you're saying about that every work, like everything that you do has dignity. So going back to, to the idea of happiness, why is it important to find happiness at work? It's really important because we can bring our best when we're happier. Like happiness is so correlated with all kinds of positive outcomes. When we're happier, we tend to be more physically healthy. That's good for businesses as well because they pay lower costs in terms of insurance. When we're happier, we tend to set bigger goals. We tend to reach them more, um, more frequently. When we're happier, we tend to perform better. When we're happier, we tend to have better relationships. When we're happier at work, that has a spillover effect. And we tend to also be happier in our personal lives and our work, our lives outside of work. So there are all these benefits, not just for us, but for businesses as well. And I think the critical thing is that we can also start to think that happiness is something that is, is ever present. If we're doing it right, we're always happy. And in truth, happiness can absolutely ebb and flow. Like we can have a bad day at work or we can have a really tough project that goes on for a while, or we can have a season of life that challenges us, you know, especially. And so there's definitely an ebb and flow in happiness, but overall, we're looking for joy and contentment. Overall, we're looking to create the conditions for happiness. And interestingly, um, when we pursue happiness for its own sake, we tend to be less likely to accomplish it. Better is to pursue the conditions that are associated with happiness. And that's something that's so within our power to do in terms of our work and our lives. Mm. And how do we figure that out? How do we figure out what are those conditions that are actually going to give us the happiness? Is it trial and error or is it something that you already no, it's somehow within you. How do we, yeah, how do we figure that out? Yeah, I think that's a great question. We have the opportunity 
to really reflect. And I think we're more capable of creating the conditions for happiness when we're more reflective and when we're able to really think about our own experiences and when we empower ourselves to make some of those choices. So like um, when we have a greater sense of purpose and we feel connected to something outside of ourselves, that tends to be a condition for happiness. When we are more grateful, when we have a, a deep sense of gratitude, that is associated with happiness. Um, when we are connected to our people, whether we're introverted or extroverted, when we have some connection to the people around us and we express generosity, that is super correlated with happiness. Um, when we have the opportunity to perform well, that's a condition for happiness. And another um, is learning and stretch. So, you know, when we have the opportunity to really try something new, to really push ourselves, that's also a condition for happiness. So those are some of the things that we can start to think about in terms of creating happiness for ourselves, empowering ourselves toward a happiness. Is there one of these areas that's the one that creates the most unhappy environment? Is there just one thing that's universally, it's just terrible? Hmm. Yeah. You know, they all count, but I think one of the things that underlies everything related to happiness is our connections with people. You know, like there's so much research. If we feel isolated, if we feel ostracized, we experience pain in the same part of our brain where we experience physical pain. When we don't feel connected to our people, we have greater morbidity, we have greater mortality. Social isolation is absolutely correlated with um, all kinds of mental health issues like depression or anxiety. And so that feels like it underlies lots and lots of these other conditions that need to feel a sense of community, that need to feel a sense of belonging, that need to feel a sense of connection. And again, even if we're more on the introverted side of the continuum, we still need those things. We just may need fewer people in a more deep relationship, for example, but we still need each other desperately. Mm. That's the one thing that I see the most is when the relationships are tense, particularly with your immediate boss. And I feel like that what makes extremely difficult. You might love what you're doing. You might love your colleagues. You might love, you know, everything associated with that. But then there is that relationship, which is very difficult to change. It's probably one of the most difficult to change when that doesn't work. I feel that like that becomes extremely difficult to li live with. And I have heard of the phenomenon of experiencing sort of that pain, this, you know, when you're, you're rejected or socially isolated, that you actually experience pain in the same centers in your brain as you do with physical pain and just how important that sense of connection is to us. Yeah. Which brings me to the point about leaders, because obviously, you know, for me, culture comes from the top and, you know, all of the, and I, I don't remember exactly the words that in your book, but um, I think you talk about and it just escapes me now, but you know, you know, it's, I'll come back to that. But what I'm talking about is with leaders, they are the ones who are setting the scene with, with everything that happens in, in the organization. And it's like, oh, I think it's again on tip of my tongue, what I'm trying to say <laughs> from your book, I have it written down somewhere on my notes, but I think it was like, I think culture is, um, the behavior, the worst behavior yes. of the individuals within the team or something along those lines. That's what I'm trying to remember. And let's talk about leaders, like what should be leaders be aware of and what they should be doing? Yeah. And is it their responsibility? Yes, I love that. Um, I think you're referring to culture is determined by the worst behavior it will tolerate. That's Which I just think is so interesting, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. And leaders are so critical to that to that process. Like, um, if we look at the data on talent attraction and retention, and you know this better than anybody, so you can correct me if you see it differently. But you know, like we know that people tend to join an organization for the culture as a whole and the opportunity people are going to have within the culture and within the organization. They tend to stay because they have a best friend at work, which is all about relationships. 
relationships, right? Culture is all about relationships. We experience culture through our relationships. They tend to stay because they've got great relationships on a team and a best friend at work, which is all about relationships. And we know the the number one reason people leave an organization is because of a leader. You know, like they may not feel a good chemistry with the leader, a good res- relationship with the leader. They may not feel like the leader has their best interest in mind. They may not feel like a leader's paying enough attention. And um, I think one of the things leaders need to be really sensitive to is staying present and attuned to people. There's a beautiful study that was done a, a, about a year ago now, I think it was last spring, um, and it said it found that when leaders were more tuned in, more present, more accessible, people experienced a greater sense of mental health. When leaders demonstrated more empathy, people reported better mental health. And it didn't need to be that the leader was a social worker or an expert in mental health, but just that the leader was paying attention and people felt like they mattered enough the leader was paying attention. I think that's one. And I think that has everything to do with recognition and celebration and a leader paying attention to people's um, passions and as much as possible helping to align their work with their passion. That's not always possible in a perfect manner. But I think when we can think about that, the other thing that I think is critical for leaders is holding people accountable. Like, I think sometimes leaders are shy about that, right? Like they don't want to push too hard, particularly now when we know that um, people are struggling or challenged. But in reality, people want to be held accountable. They want to know their work matters enough that they need to deliver. And accountability is fundamentally about a leader who's paying enough attention to be able to give you feedback, to be able to make suggestions, to be able to coach, to be able to really expect that you will complete your work because it's critical to the process as a whole. So I think accountability is one of the things we don't talk about as much, Mm. but can be so empowering when leaders hold people accountable and demonstrate that they're paying attention. Mm. That's a great point. And talking about the Great Recession. <laughs> so, you know, what is this? And, you know, from your perspective, like what is happening in the world now? Mm, this is such interesting times. You know, one of the things that we know is that we had um, uh, we had record um, employment and then we went to record unemployment within a matter of months globally. And now as the economy comes back, if you look at the economics and the people who are expert in studying economics, we find that the um, the journey back has been faster than what anybody anticipated. And that is partly what's fueling this talent revolution. The other thing that has happened, um, which is which is so interesting, I heard a brilliant economist talking about this, and she said there has been a fundamental severing of people's loyalty and commitment to their jobs, to their employers, and to their regions. Globally, this is true. Usually when we go through a downturn, people hold tight to their roles, to their jobs, to their companies because they're afraid of losing their jobs. But what has happened in this downturn and now this upturn is that people are really, really rethinking what they do, why they do it, with whom they work, with which company they work, what kind of um, elements are part of the employee value equation. People are thinking about that so deeply and they have this fresh air effect, this grass is greener effect. And so the great recession followed by a talent revolution where as leaders, as organizations, we need to be especially attuned to articulating an employee value equation, delivering an employee value equation that is compelling for people because the content of our work and how we align with our passions and our work is fundamental to our fulfillment. And that is a criteria for our decision-making in regard to who we're going to work for and who we're going to work with. Mm. And is it something that has happened in the past? Or do you think this is a unique situation in the history of the world? Yeah, that is definitely a yes and no answer. It's really interesting. After the pandemic of 1918 followed the Roaring Twenties, which was a 
period of more global expansion, more GDP growth, more educational attainment and growth than ever in history. And there are people who are expecting this will be similar. We'll have this giant upswing in terms of our opportunities as individuals, as teams, as organizations, as economies. And so that is similar. However, What's different about this is um, I heard a, this, this economist talk about a fireworks recovery. You know how we've had all this debate about what kind of recovery? Is it a hockey stick require uh, recovery? Is it an N? Is it an M? Is it, you know, all of that kind of thing? And um, it's really a fireworks recovery because what's happening is that we're seeing recovery in certain places and then we're seeing challenges in other parts of the economy, partly because of supply chain issues. And that is unique in history. And what that means for us in terms of happiness at work is that we may see a shift in the choices that are available to us. Like we're kind of at this moment where we almost need a reboot of the ecosystem, right? You hear companies saying, oh, we can't hire people. We can't find people. And you have all this data about candidates who are being ghosted. And so they can't find a role, right? And so there's this mismatch. So that is unique in history. And it gives us tons of opportunity, right? Like for us to think about what do I want to do and what might be the opportunities to do that that are new for all of us. Mm. I find this fascinating about ghosting. And I think this was your article the other day. Right. Yes. Yeah. So I was just skimming, skimming through that. And I mean, ghosting has always happened, but I just feel like it's now at a rate that has just never existed before. And to some extent, I think, well, there's a lot more volume. You're trying to get through a lot of people. So I understand that, you know, sometimes things will slip. I have to admit that I'm not perfect either from my perspective. So I know that ha sometimes happens, but I feel like the, the danger is also sometimes like you're looking for the people, but you're not quite sure what it is, but then you don't follow up. You don't say what it is that you're not happy with, or that doesn't match what you, you're, what you're looking for, because actually you don't quite have worked that out. And in the end, it's just damaging your brand and your business. And eventually that's going to catch up with you, in my opinion. Yes, well, I agree. I think that's so interesting. Like this new data on ghosting is huge majorities of people have been ghosted. And they say if they've been ghosted by a company, they're never going to apply to that company again. And we can understand that we're all under so much respect responsibility. And it's it's almost like with any hiring process, you're trying to find the needle in the haystack. You're trying to find that perfect person, that as perfect as possible, the match, right? Mm. Um, but the haystack has gotten bigger. And so I think it's increasingly challenging. And I think the interesting thing about looking for new work or making a shift is that there is an emotional commitment that we need to make to that process, right? We put ourselves out there. We invite scrutiny. We invite critique. And while there's wonderful opportunity on the other side of that, it's also a really big um, investment of our emotional energy, not to mention our time. Mm. So talking about stay or leave, how do you decide, you know, you're at a crossroads, maybe you're not super happy, but, you know, it's okay, you know, you've spent some time thinking about it, you know, there's certain things that maybe you can improve, but like, how do you make, how do you make a decision whether you stay or whether you go? Yeah, I think this is so important for us to think about really, really consciously, because right now we're also seeing more rage quitting than we've seen in the past. People are kind right. of on the edge. They're very, you know, can be more anxious um, right now in terms of mental health. And so there can be this like moment where you want to snap or just, you know, kind of shut the door. And I think we want to talk ourselves off of that cliff and think really hard about what keeps us, why we joined in the first place, the extent to which needs are being met. That's one element. Another element is to think about the investment we will need to make in order to make a change. 
And then um, a third element is to think about how great that potential new situation could be. Um, there's a wonderful formula for change that works in all different kinds of change situations. And it is, do you have a vision of the future, like how, how cool and wonderful a different opportunity might be? Do you have knowledge of practical first steps? Like, yeah, I know how to update my resume. Yeah, I know how to go do some networking. Yes, I know how to kind of get on the radar screen of the right recruiters. Um, and the third piece is, do we have enough of a sense of dissatisfaction with the present? All of those things have to be greater than our perception of the risks and the costs, because it takes time. And as we were saying, we have to put ourselves out there. So when you think about those four, I think it's interesting to consider stay or leave in light of those four. Like I might be really dissatisfied and I know exactly what steps to take, but I'm not sure how great the new might be. I may not have that vision, or maybe I've got vision and I've got knowledge and I've got dissatisfaction, but oh, I just like, it's going to be a huge investment of time. And maybe I have small children and maybe I have a lot of other things. And so those four elements I think are interesting. There's mm. one other thing I would put out there and I love your perspectives on this too. Mm -hmm. um, I love to think about a two by two model. Every great, every sociologist has a two by two model somewhere in their toolkit, right? <laughs> um, but you know, like, like, to what extent um, do you have influence on the things that's the things that are challenging for you at work, or make it an unsatisfactory situation? And then, um, to what extent are those kind of um, under your control, or to what extent are those? Um, sort of more global issues within the organization or more focused issues within the organization. And I think if we have a really big issue and we have lots of influence, that's a moment to stay. We can make it better for ourselves. We can make it better for others who are part of our community. On the other hand, if it's a huge issue and we have very little influence on it now or in the future, that might be an opportunity to leave, right? Or maybe it's a small issue and we don't have a lot of influence and that could guide us probably in either direction. You get the idea. So I think it's also helpful to think about our influence and how big the issue is and the relationship of those as um, elements of our assessment as well. Mm. This idea of having control over your circumstances is so important. I mean, we're talking about, you know, test on learned helplessness, where no matter what you do, nothing kind of changes. And that is a terrible place to be in. And um, I know Nir Ayal, who I also spoke to a little while ago, he talked about how sort of, you know, the definition of a toxic environment is having lots of responsibility and very little control and autonomy. And I think that's when you feel that you know, you you have to deliver and you have to do this, but you actually cannot change certain aspects of what you do. And that is a very, very difficult place to be. But then on the flip side, what you're saying is if you do have that uh, opportunity to control it, actually, this is a place of growth where you can, you know, step into even a bigger version of yourself and make an impact. And it might be difficult, it might be frustrating, but actually you can achieve a lot more with that. And, um, and that's, as you're saying, that's where you should stay. Um, just looking at other maybe, you know, different scenarios, you know, for example, you know, being headhunted, you know, you maybe have several offers on the table. Like, what do you go for? Do you go for bigger salary, bigger opportunities for growth, um, walking distance to your house, like what, you know, how do you, how do you make a decision about what's the right thing? Oh, that's a great question. I love that. You know, I think your point about autonomy is also really, really important. Just one other thing going back to that is we know that when people have more autonomy, they tend to have better mental health and choice is, and control are utterly correlated with engagement. We tend to be more engaged. We tend to bring more discretionary effort. We tend to feel more fulfillment. So I think it's such a great point you make. And the decision-making, I think, needs to be really individual. I mean, this is going to sound so cliche, but, you know, like make a list of what your key priorities are, you know, and, and then look at 
how well that new opportunity is going to meet those priorities and, and judge those opportunities against each other. Because happiness is really the alignment of those things, you know, like, like maybe I want to be walking distance to the office, but somebody else doesn't care about that a bit. And so that needs to be different in terms of our choice making. In general, if we look at kind of what drives all of us and what statistically tends to be correlated with happiness, the things that matter most are a job where we feel like there is a bigger picture that we can uniquely influence when we have opportunities where there's um, room for growth and development and challenge. Those are absolutely correlated. And I think another thing to really think about is our fit with the culture. You know, like we need that, we need that dynamic tension where we can bring something new and, you know, bring all of ourselves that may refresh and renew and stretch the culture. But we also want to feel that fit with our people. And so as we reflect on who did I talk to? Who did I interview with? Who did I feel a real connection with? Those should also be really important. I have a personal bias that it's it's not all about salary. Um, salary is, um, if we look at the sociological resource, uh, research, salary is a satisfier, but not a motivator statistically and, and based on the science of organizational development. Um, we need a certain salary. We have to reach a certain threshold in order to feel not just like we can, you know, put groceries on the table and put gas in our cars um, or, you know, uh, walk to the corner grocery store and be able to buy groceries. Um, but also we, we need to feel that threshold of value, right? Because salary is absolutely a, a reflection of the value of the work that we're doing. So we need a certain salary. But beyond that, the things that motivate us are challenge and connection and purpose. Um, it's been described as a great meal. You know how you can have a great meal on a Friday night and you leave the restaurant and you're like, Oh, that was delicious. I'm so full. I never need to eat again. But, you know, by Sunday morning, you're kind of, you know, you're ready for breakfast. And so salary is like that. It meets a certain amount of needs and it satisfies us, but it may not put us over the top. So I think that's something to think about as we're making decisions is a salary that we feel is valuing enough of us, a salary we feel is fair, a salary that will meet our um, monetary and economic needs, and there's more to it as well. Hmm. And let's talk about your preferences. So just like quick fire questions, and that's just based on some of the things from, from your book. Um, working alone or working in a team? Oh, both. Um, probably more on the team side, but I do like my work alone, depending on the task. Saying yes or saying no? Oh, yes, definitely. Yes. We have to have good boundaries, but yes is a great option because it gives us lots of opportunities. Culture or purpose? Oh, gosh, that's a that's a terrible choice. <laughs> <laughs> I love your challenge. Uh, I think, um, oh gosh, that's so hard. Culture. Big dreams or small goals, dreams? Small, definitely small. Small gets us to big. And being under pressure or having freedom? Oh, uh, you know, I kind of thrive on pressure. <laughs> Good pressure. <laughs> <laughs> And well, that, that's great. Thank you for that. And um, but sh who should be responsible for providing purpose at work? Oh. Is it the individual? Is it the, the founder? Is it the CEO? Like who, who is who should be leading that? Yeah, I think the answer is kind of in the question who should be leading that. Like, I think leaders have a fundamental responsibility, obligation, honor of creating that purpose. You know, that like, why are we here and what do we need to pull together to do for our customers within our market niche, right? Like leaders have that fundamental responsibility. And then as we filter through the organization, we all have a responsibility to kind of interpret that in a meaningful way. You know, like, like my organization as a whole might be about helping people reach their potential and all the different aspects of their work. But within my role, I have a certain lens on that. 
And I think we have an opportunity individually and as teams as well. You know, like we have a responsibility to ask enough questions. We have a responsibility to um, think about how our work matters. We have a responsibility to raise our hands and volunteer for that next thing that we could do that might be slightly outside of our swim lane or slightly outside of our current capabilities, but for which we want to stretch and for which we believe we can make a great contribution. So we have a responsibility to be empowered to connect with that purpose and the organization and leaders have a responsibility to create that purpose as well. So I think it's a bit of a both and. Mm. Well, it's this idea of clawing back any kind of control that you can have right so you know when you know the first one of the first um quotes from your from your book was you know you can choose happiness you can choose joy when you're choosing where you work though you know the culture that you work in or who you work with you know you you have that choice but also you have that even in situations where you don't necessarily you know not everything is working to your advantage, but you can still choose pockets of of things that you can actually control. Uh, but actually, the, when it comes to the bigger picture, that's down to the leaders. So on that, what is great leadership to you? Great leadership, I think, I think it actually starts with purpose. I think great leadership is about creating that sense of purpose, which we talked about. I think great, great leadership is aligning people with that purpose, giving them meaningful work and being articulate about how their work ladders to that purpose. Great leadership is also aligning as much as possible people's passions and what they love to do with what they get to do. Again, we can't always have a perfect match, but as much as possible. Great leadership is about being personally present, accessible, attentive. Great leadership is also about connecting the team with each other, um, helping people to have great team relationships, helping to foster social capital. And great leadership is about creating opportunities for that next stretch, that next growth opportunity, giving coaching, giving guidance, thinking about the future for the business and for the employee who's part of your team. This is such a big thing, I think, when I think about amazing leaders where they take, where they take, not responsibility, but when they take, they pay attention to the individual. So it's not about just them keeping them stuck in where they are, but actually giving them opportunities for growth. And sometimes it means that it's not within the organization. And the ones who achieve that connection with, with those people, they are massive winners because you know life can take in so many different directions and i know when i speak to some people it's like i remember this person and they made such an impact on me you know i wrote them like a power thank you because they they really made a difference and forever they will feel that that person made such a huge impact in their lives and then they can become clients they can even work together at some point again or you know even become bosses uh, and vice versa so you know that is such a critical thing and I think we don't talk about that enough so. Yeah, it's a great point. It's like doing the right thing for people is always the right thing. And mm -hmm. it, it makes me think, you know, like if people are performing brilliantly, it's hard to help them move to their next role for growth because you hate to lose them on your team. Mm -hmm. But it's the right thing to do. Or if people are struggling with performance, you're not doing them any favors by not holding them accountable. And by, you know, a lot of times if people are struggling with their performance, they need a different match. They need a different opportunity. So as leaders, I love your point. Like we're attentive to people and we're doing the right thing for whatever their next step is, for whatever their future is. And that will serve us in the long term for mm. sure. Mm. Who did you write the book for? Hmm. I've never been asked that question before. I think I wrote it for, I think I wrote it because of my own thinking process and because of the desire to put some thoughts out into the world, right? Like, like I, I'm not arrogant enough to think, well, you know, I had all the right answers and I'm going to impart those, right? 
But I do think it's so interesting to think about important topics and to be able to capture and codify and think about those in written form and be able to put that out into the world and start a dialogue with people about an important topic. I love the idea that we all have an instinct to matter. Isn't that lovely? I just, you know, so like we all want to put our thinking out there and we all do that in different ways, but partly it's putting it out there to to maybe make a contribution, but certainly to uh, influence a dialogue or start a dialogue or foster a dialogue. And what would you want those readers to do after reading your book? You know, I would really like both the idea of agency and structure. Like agency is we are empowered to create the conditions for our own happiness. I would love for people to think about their situations really intentionally and reflect. I would love for them to make kind of day-to-day decisions and choices that will foster their own happiness. I would love for them to feel empowered about where they go from here. That's the agency part of it. And then I think the structure part of it is realizing how much influence we all have on each other. You know, sociologically speaking, the number one way that we learn is through watching other people, listening to other people, experiencing other people. And so while I am not responsible for your happiness or yours or yours or yours, I do have influence over the situations that I'm a part of. And I have a healthy obligation and responsibility to the community to kind of be my best and do my best and continue to learn and do better to the extent that I can. And so for me, the structure sure part of it is for us to walk away and say how I show up, how I interact matters to the conditions other people are facing and take responsibility for that, that as well. Well, Tracy, thank you so much for that. You know, it's just such, you know, great food for thought and, you know, talking about sort of autonomy and structure. And it's funny when I ask you, you know, what do you want people to do? And I kind of asked that deliberately because I have this interesting kind of internal conversation between sort of doing and thinking. And also because Mm -hmm. I had a conversation with Dr. Brennan Jacoby, who is a philosopher, and he helps businesses to think their best. So a lot of our conversation was about how can you actually spend time thinking, not just sort of sitting there with no kind of, you know, purpose, which has a place in itself, but actually, you know, more kind of focused, um, um, you know, deliberate thinking. And, you know, this, this idea of thought and putting more thought into it rather than, you know, necessarily being kind of reactive and just, you know, being more self-reflective, I think is really key. And, and I really enjoy it. You know, I've really enjoyed reading your book and, and thank you for, for putting that out into the world. And I'll have a look at your, your other book as well, which is I think bringing life into work and, um, And last question, actually, is work-life balance dead? (laughs) Oh, that's good. You know, on your point about thinking, I love the mantra, change your thinking, change your life, right? Like the way we think about things, even the words we use to describe things, linguistic determinism matters in how we approach things. And I also love the idea that true knowledge of something requires action. Like if I know that I should wear my seatbelt in order to be more safe in my car, but I don't ever put it on, I don't really know that thing. Or if I know that I should eat more vegetables in order to be healthier, but I never eat a vegetable, I don't really know. And so thinking and knowing are also related to action. So I love that point. I think Well, it came... I want to just touch on that because I did watch your TED talk as well. And I can't remember if you used a word, I think it's a Danish word. Is mm. it a Danish word? Which, which, I think so, which, which, which combines the thinking and the doing. And it really made me ponder about, actually, it's true. Like what we think is exemplified by our actions and everything, you know, it's, it's kind of like the parent is like, do as I say and not as I do. And actually culture is determined by the behavior. And, you know, trust comes from what you're doing rather than what you're saying. But, you know, they, they go very much hand in hand. It's not one or the other. It has to be both. 
Yeah, exactly. I worked with a leader many, many years ago, and he used to say to people around him all the time, you're behaving so loudly, I can hardly hear what you're saying. Isn't that I great? say this to my daughter. <laughs> Not exactly the same words, but it's like when she's screaming for him, it's like, I can't hear what you're saying. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. We understand people based on their actions and we understand ourselves based on our actions. And that actually leads to the work-life question, right? Like the choices we make about our time are so much the choices we make about our life. Like the day-to-day -day choices about how we spend our time are how we spend our lives. And so that behavior is absolutely a reflection of our values, of our priorities, of our, um, of the way that we think about things and the sense that we make of conditions and of our role and mm -hmm. our contribution. And I think um, hopefully work life could work life balance could be dead, right? Like I think that um, I think balance is actually kind of a limiting concept because it suggests that you have to choose between work and everything else. But work is part of a full life. It's part of how we express our talents. It's part of how we create relationships. It's part of where fulfillment comes from. In addition, balance suggests that you not only have to choose, but there's a precariousness, right? Like I, I can't have it all. I'll, you know, fall off of the balance beam. And balance also isn't enough. Like we should demand more, right? Like I want work-life fulfillment. I want work-life integration. I want multiple right answers to work life because you might manage work life and navigate those differently than me or her or him or them. And so we need to make room for those multiple right answers and how we navigate those boundaries, how we set those boundaries. We all need boundaries. We all need both. And we need to be able to kind of be empowered to choose how we manage that ourselves. So I think work-life balance isn't a big enough concept and hopefully it can go away at some point. I think work-life fulfillment, work-life navigation, work-life harmony are better concepts because they suggest this both and. They suggest how much we can get from each of those and how much they're a part of each other. Mm. Tracy, such a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been really wonderful to speak with you and learning from you and just, you know, absorbing your such positive and wonderful energy, at least over a, a video, but um, really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much for joining us here on Anatomy of a Leader. I hope our guest leadership journeys resonate with you and make you feel like you too can take on the world. Please subscribe so you can be alerted when new episodes are released. Comment, like, tell a friend, share on social media. I'll make sure to support you there as well. And let me know what inspired you, the changes that you've made, and how you too succeeded against all odds. You can find me on Instagram and LinkedIn with the handle MariaHVO, or just search for my very long surname. And if you're hiring leaders to take your business to the next level, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Again, that long surname. Thank you again for being here on Anatomy of a Leader. Bye for now.